My name is Dr. Matt Miner, but just call me Matt. Uh, it's pronounced my nerd because I'm a nerd. But anyways, I'm here. I'm a physical therapist by trade, but I'm really passionate about teaching people how to move forward. And so today I'm here to show Mark and Graham uh, just one of the, the three skills. I've kind of taken time to whittle down all these different things about running. How can we see like, what's the most important elements and then what in order can we teach those in? And so one way that we can provide feedback, visual and video is one way, but I've uh, made a tennis ball necklace is another method where I have my patients, I have my clients. Show, this is like an external representation of my center of mass. And I'm able to use tactile feedback of when the, the ball hits them or auditory feedback of what the ball is doing. This ball hits me in the nuts and makes me run fast. You squeal. Yeah. So that's just one method that, we, that I have. And so I'm going to show them the three skills of running. This is what it is. It's the three skills in order are first, and I'll show you what the ball should or shouldn't do, and I'll, go, I'll take them through this process. The first is how we move forward, is the first thing is a learned skill of arm swing. Our arms should swing forward and back, and notice how the motion's coming from my shoulders. It's not coming at my elbows. And if I'm doing it right, the ball actually will spin around its vertical axis, and my hips are moving, but I'm not actively moving them, it's passive. And this is where some of that reciprocal movement of the arms helps to assist the legs. So that's the first skill is arm swing forward and back at the shoulders. The second is called the hankle, hinging at the ankle. To move forward, where my center of mass is in relationship to my body, when I go to land and load through the ground, where my center of mass is, is gonna dictate what happens. So if I'm teaching someone to run and they're vertical, their weight's back, and they're gonna be landing and loading in front of them. And what will happen is the ball will move out and come back and hit them. So that's something that we'll be looking for. If someone's leaning forward, but they're hinging at the hips, my center of mass is also back. And this is where heel striking, this position, and if I'm vertical, can be dangerous. But I'm teaching them how to lean forward, hinging at the ankles. And notice how the ball stays in contact with my body. If I'm hinging here, the ball goes out forward. The final skill is the hardest. It's learning how to move forward leave the ground and move horizontal, not leave the ground and go up in the air and come down. Those are the three uh, learned skills. So I'm gonna take them through first arm swing in that order, then leaning, and then teaching how to leave the ground moving horizontal using the, more of a glute and a hip strategy to move horizontal versus pushing down. Do things change if someone's sprinting? If someone's sprinting, they're probably jumping a bit, right? That's where I'd like to try to teach, no, you don't have to. And we talked earlier about like, it depends on how long you're going. If it's 100 meters, efficiency isn't as important. You don't have to be work, work on being as efficient as possible. But just kind of like your car and driving, if we drive in the city versus neighborhood versus highway, we still call it driving, it's just different speeds. Same with walking, jogging, running. It's the same direction of moving forward. But ideally what I try to teach is when we're sprinting, the faster we go, we push the ground back three Fs, further, faster, and fur farther. Uh, it's like the cadence of it. So uh, the analogy I use is like if I'm in a canoe moving forward, if I had a paddle in the water, I put the paddle back in the water, I push back to move forward and horizontal. The leg, ideally, we're trying to mainly push straight back to the ground. If we're pushing down through the ground, it's not that it's wrong, it just doesn't have to be efficient on a level surface. If you're doing hills, you have to use your calves and your quads to propel, but separating the, the running into the propulsion piece of moving your body forward versus the landing and the loading, trying to separate it out. So ideally, no matter what speed you're running, the overall mechanics should be similar, but we're just doing things at an amplified level, pushing back further, faster, more force, um, and just leaning further in addition to the speed. All right, so let's do this. We're gonna go, we'll be on this line, and how I like to teach skills, I think of it like I'm transferring this information to you, I'm transferring the skills. There's different steps to it. Think of these as reps. First rep, you're just demonstrating. You're just watching, you're not doing it yet. I always pick my target eye level because that's going to be another form of visual feedback. I imagine like I'm holding on to a handsaw and then I'm moving forward and back, forward and back. And see how I'm doing it right? The ball is just vertically moving around its axis. I'm not moving my body. I'm not moving my shoulders. I'm here. Let me shake it out. Watch again. Eyes level here forward and back, shake it out, one more and then we're going to sync up and do it together, boom, boom, 
But if you notice, really just my upper arm, that's what's doing the movement. When we walk, same story, the arms, we just bend the elbows up to make it more mass moment of inertia, but the motion is still coming forward and back from my shoulders. So once you guys stand here with me, and so we're gonna use mirror neurons, we're gonna sync it up together. So kind of look at me. First, establish eye level at something, at that truck that's not gonna move. And then imagine like you're holding on to a handsaw. Yep. And so it's kind of like, here is I'm making sure that I'm not shrugging up using my traps at all. I'm kind of lightly putting my shoulder blades in my back pockets. I'll say, imagine your shoulder blades are precious. Don't let anybody steal them. Keep them in your back pockets. And now it's just like we're lightly grabbing that handsaw. We're moving forward and back, forward and back. But watch, watch me, see what you guys are doing. This is not wrong, but you're still having an element of that up and down to it. So I talk about axing going up and down versus sawing. So from here, trying to just have this pure forward and back, forward and back, forward and back. And see if you can get into it a little more so the ball actually moves. Oh, sorry, let's actually adjust that because ideally you want this ball to be close to the center of mass. So I usually have people measure it to around belly button height to give us that feedback. I go a little bit lower with it. And I always get with the big breasted women, big chested men, doesn't matter. It's still, we can still do it. We can still make it happen. Right. Yep, cool. All right. So we're here, eye level, handsaw, forward and back, forward and back. Another way I like to think about it is if I have a hand towel and I'm drying off my low back, it's more of this forward and back, but the motion's all coming from the shoulders. Yep. And ideally the hips are rotating, but it's more coming from the reciprocal movement. I'm rotating around my spine. Like we talked about the spine, I'm trying to use that as an axis to rotate around. If we're doing it right, the ball is, is rotating around its vertical axis. Okay, shake it out. Let's do it one more time. Eyes, arms, forward and back. Good. All right, now give me three reps where I'm just watching you guys. First two, we'll have the tennis ball necklace on and then we'll take it off to see if you can mimic the mechanics. So I'm going to give it to me from start to finish, please. Yep, and ideally mark the wrist. They can stay in neutral, like they don't have to be out like this. Having the wrist in neutral, just like if you were holding that handsaw and there's a piece of wood here and we're trying to cut forward and back. And the angle is everyone's different with their scapular angle. If you're usually out here like this, that's not natural. That scapular plane is normally about 30 degrees inwards. So just having the wrist in neutral, lightly grabbing. Okay, let's take the tennis ball necklace off and give me two reps with just the arms, make sure it looks the same before we move on. Yep, there you go. It should feel light, like it's lightly your lats are going back, lightly the pecs and the anterior delts are going forward. But ideally the main role of the arms with running is just to assist the legs reciprocally. If the arms aren't moving and they're not moving in sync, the legs will have to work harder. Beautiful. All right, the last piece, tennis ball necklace on. We're gonna do the lean. This one's pretty quick. So what we're gonna do for the lean is watch me. I've got the stack that I call where my head, my shoulders, my ankles, my hips are all in a line. And when I lean forward, watch, I still keep that stack, but I'm just hinging at the ankles. And the reason why, what I'm doing here is I'm just taking my center of mass and I'm just lightly shifting my center of mass forward to bias forward. And this is where, when it comes to setting up the landing, I don't teach the landing part. I only teach the lean. Because we always talk about, it's always about landing and loading as close to underneath you as possible. And watch when I lean forward, my feet are underneath me more. So by keeping this slight forward lean, it allows me to have more of this uh, continuous movement. So let's try that. We're gonna build arms to 90, forward and back. And then now we're gonna add that slight lean. And notice how when you lean forward, it's like your body weight is going from your heels to your forefoot, but keep your heels down. Yep, he's got it. So you see how his heels are down, you'll feel your calves working and fighting that urge to let your shoulders go out in front of your hips. So we're here, lean, yep. And then add that little arm swing just to keep it. Because now what happens, now we have this angle of forward, 
If I keep going forward and back like this, now that I'm leaned, I don't want to add that upwards bit at all. So see how you're going reverting back to the up and down more? Have a little more forward and back. Think about that drying off your low back. Beautiful. All right, we got the first two skills down. Arm swing, forward and back, the lean. Here's what it looks like when it's all together. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna sync up the arms and you're gonna try to move horizontal and your goal is to keep as minimal up and down movement as, as possible. Let me try it again, let me show you. We're here, here. Let's just go into it. I wanted you to do a longer span and I wanted you to just do your own thing. I wanted you to, the goal was to try to keep the ball moving as minimal as possible. Okay, just, all right. just try not to let the ball move. Yep. So let's just do this. The only thing I would try to add to here is let's see if we can cover. I do like the idea of like the low and slow. I think that there's a lot of value and merit to like making sure that your landing not, isn't so crazy every time. Man. Yeah. Let's see if we can try to have you run a little bit faster than that and see what happens. Cause you're doing all right. You're just going very light. You could just yeah. get more of the gliding, more of the pushing back, right. moving more. Okay, let's do this. Let's take the tennis ball necklace off. Try one more thing. So do this with me. This is the tush push drill. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna work on first this left side where you're extending your hip. We're using the glute. That's what's pushing back. Try that with me. Let's do it. Fingertips on the glutes just to feel the engagement. You're pushing back. Yep, feel the muscles push out, your fingertips out. And again. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do that same exact thing, but close chain, we'll watch. Now I'm pushing back. Everything's the same, I'm still extending my hip, but now it's on the ground versus lifting up. Watch, watch me, your shoulders, you're kind of starting to lean up with it. See if we can maintain that slight lean Couple more, you're still kind of, there you go. Try to kind of lean into it a little more, lean into me. There, trying to avoid that leaning up with it. Yeah, if I'm gonna flex my glute, though, I kind of want to, you know, like a. Yep, just keeping it more stable. Kind of what I'm used to doing, I think. And in my mind, I'm pushing the ground backwards. And see if as you get more comfortable, you can push a little bit further, extend a little bit further back. See what you start doing there just a little bit though? And it's, some of it's probably the shoes. You're starting to push down. Instead of just pushing purely horizontal, watch my head height. It stays level and goes down. It doesn't go up. So keeping the calves quiet and learning to just use a hip strategy. Okay, let's switch around and we're gonna use the other side. So we just work the left, let's work the right. Okay, let's bring it close chain now. Same story, same movement. Yep, and try to look up a little more high now, yep. It helps to maintain your posture. So this is your engine. This is what propels you. Every time that you're trying to move your body forward, this is it. This is that paddle in the water, pushing the water backwards to move you forward and learning how to do this instead of pushing down and going up. Next level before we take it to actually moving, 
Everything's the same, but now I'm gonna try to push so far back that I'm gonna actually leave the ground. So I'm here. So you see, everything's the same. I'm just trying to get more distance between step each time. See what it reverts back to wanting to do? See how it makes you want to start to push down again? So see if we can just do... I can't really tell or, or feel it. Well, some of it with the shoes, you're not, it's biasing you to push down through the balls of your feet anyways. But it's just trying to move purely horizontal using this hip strategy. If I want to run faster, I push further and faster. What are you feeling besides awkward? Uh, it just feels like a stretch in my quad, and I'm more so than anything. Let's do the other side on the way back, and we'll put like it on. I use my glutes when I run, but I don't know. Maybe I don't. But it's not that you're not, it's just at that speed, it wouldn't be efficient. If you were using your glutes at these slower speeds and doing this, we're trying to match it with... Power Yeah. So let's try now, now with the right side. Sometimes if people have a mobility restriction of their hips, of their quads, if you're feeling pulling, sometimes that can limit you from doing this quite as much. Yeah, it's weird, cause like, I don't know, I guess I would say like, it's more of a passive flex of my glute than it is like a real flex. Cause I don't think. Well, the propulsion part, the ground part, the glute does hip extension. So that's, that and your hamstrings is what's responsible for this. We're so used to thinking about the landing and that piece is, is different. I found if folk, you can only focus on one thing and by focusing on leaving the ground and on the ground instead of the landing, we just get more bang for your buck. Let's see if now you can do that same. Sometimes I've seen you don't even have to think about it just for us doing this and pre-program your glutes to work. Try it again. Think about that pushing the ground backwards. You know, my, my, my biggest challenge is that I don't have a wide stride, you know, so. Yeah, well, the, like you shouldn't, you shouldn't, short. you're talking about the width or the length? The length, the length of my stride yeah. is not. That's normal. At your speeds, it wouldn't be normal to have a longer right. step. But even when I try to go faster, I'm not. You were doing it there. No, I know. I'm just like, uh, it's, it's a challenging part of running for me for now. Before I interject any more nonsense, let's just go, let's go down to that second line all the way down there. And I'm not going to talk to you first. I'm going to try to figure it out and then I'll see what you're doing. Ready? Okay. I don't need to do more. What'd you feel with that? Oh, good. Yeah. Let's try it again. This time, let's focus on that. Some cue I'll use for people is keep your wrists below your elbows. Because we're leaning, the wrists stay below the elbows versus going up and down. Boom. Let's go. Think about drying off your low back with that towel. If we're talking about 26.2 miles, thousands and thousands of steps, and that whole paying on the principal and in a 30 year mortgage, every little little bit adds up. So if you can save on not moving your arms as much, the more you move your arms, the more metabolic cost, the more energy. We wanna to try to save that as long as possible over the course of 26.2. So the only things I really noticed, you're doing the stride part pretty well. It's just you tend to not lean as much. You tend to kind of, just like we saw with this, tend to be a little more focused on the leaning up. Some of that may be restrictions of your hip mobility. You may have tightness that's not allowing you to open up. And the other was just, I think visually in the mirror, be able to see here versus you were doing more of that still. So you could just see right here, some of the stuff like your lower arm versus his arms coming up to his pec. He's got, he's very low in the sense that you're extending the legs a little bit more versus him. Uh, you're making a good corrections over and over again to try and lean forward. Um, one of the things I find myself is like, 
because I, I have a lot of thinking in my running with him is like I found my head started to move until so like you could see the tension in the, the chin that I find myself like holding on more tension in the jaw and chin to try and keep the spine safe. Um, and you, you obviously got relaxed. I think you have a more relaxed tone in this and I think that that's what I'm struggling with too is like yeah, tension. Well, and it's like, trying not to move. Trying yeah. To part of it. I find treadmill running is hard to teach the push back because you're yeah. teaching someone to push back on a belt that's moving back. But for efficiency, keeping people to get uh, auditory feedback of how loud it sounds when you're landing, to try to like, it's not as much about high, it's forward and back. And if you see me running at five miles per hour all the way up to 12, you'll see my arms be very low. And then as I go faster, my arm swing starts to increase matched with my legs. If this was a 5K, it doesn't matter. If this is even 10, it doesn't matter. But when the course of 26.2, that's where every teeny little bit of efficiency helps. But no, it, it, nothing I'd say about that is wrong. It could just be more efficient. Mm -hmm. Arms going forward and back, assisting the legs. If the arms are going up and down, it's really hard to not have the legs also going up and down. So it's arms match the legs. But just as we know with any teaching someone to bench or some new skill, people are so taut and tense at first and you're teaching them to only use the muscles that you need. So I try to be as relaxed as possible, only use a muscle if I'm trying to stabilize propel or control motion so I think that's I think that's good I think the only thing with you is just working on that arm swing mm -hmm. which would help a little bit um, and again if it wasn't 26.2 I'd yeah. say it doesn't really matter but you've been working on moving horizontal mm -hmm. you've been working about not picking your feet up yeah. but hopefully putting connecting some more dots when we were doing this drill using the glutes to move you forward see how close to the ground my foot stays I don't need to pick it all the way up and that's that whole paddle analogy where if I paddle and push the water back, I don't really need to pick the paddle all the way up out of the water each time. So by more gliding and skimming, and the faster I go, my foot will come up higher off the ground passively, but that's because I'm pushing further back. Yeah, I'm not actively doing it, it's passively happening because I, again, I could watch you run in the sand and see the distance between your steps. I should know how fast you're going just based off of the distance between each step. What I'm mainly talking about is long distance running, the whole concept of paying on the principal, all your energy expenditure is going towards the movement of going forward. And so just kind of finding little areas that will take that away, the not leaning, the arm swing, and the going up is all. Yeah, yeah, efficiency is the name of the game. I think there's a lot we agree on, you know, overall perspective, and I think the context of circumstances, like this setting for a competition setting or a specific distance is like efficiencies. You would, you want a car that goes over a longer distance. It's like you're gonna have a different set on the shocks for off-road versus this. And it's gonna be about, you know, cars don't go up and down for a reason. Just like every car has a different fuel efficiency, miles per gallon with training, you can change it. You can change to get more miles per gallon by being more efficient. So it's kind of the work on the training aspect, how to train to get faster, but then how do you move to not waste energy and how can you learn to not be so tense? And if you don't need it, get rid of it. Yeah. Tension in my hands, my face, all movement is expensive, expenditure. And if I can just try to just pay on the principal, keep the interest as low as possible. There's a little bit less of a stride extension I have just at the sake of saving the impact on my heel just from it feels better yeah but it's still the same exact extended the hip highest forward yeah. low arms like in terms of efficiency these are the things and what I found this is just from the pandemic and obsessing and being crazy like I used to do and say all those things things are not wrong about how shoes changes your perception your appropriate perception your heel what's on your heel but I found is it's more about your, where your center of mass is versus your foot. Yeah. And so by having the lean, so if you lean forward and try to land on something other than your heel, it just kind of shortens it up some. Yeah. And shortening the stride can just, you have to take more steps sure. to get there. I just think there's, I, I don't, that, that, that is a correct statement. The variables which afford you that ability to make that correct statement, I would say slightly, adjust the I so I was talking to tennis last night and playing tennis talking about footwear if you have shoes that have a half inch or you know 22 25 30 millimeter sack behind the heel I can extend my leg a little bit more hit the heel and get further in motion so from a competition standpoint again that like makes sense yeah 
from a joint loading perspective, even though I'd lose a little bit of the performance, it seems like there's a gain to be had. So you're saying like it will, it shortens up the stride in the front because if there's more of a heel, you're gonna actually hit the ground sooner. I can lean into that, meaning if I'm playing tennis and I'm gonna reach and really reach out with my heel, I can do that yeah. because the padding is there. Without the padding, I have to kind of back off to some of my intentional tissue. I think that's where the argument comes in, like sports, anything that you're going any direction other than constantly forward, it is different. If I need to be able to cut to the side, if I need to be able to go turn, twist, block, push through people, but just purely moving forward, reverse engineering, the direction is forward, anything doesn't. So yes, there's gonna be little differences of sport. And that's where people will, will come at you like, well, what about this? What about that? Well, yeah, it's different. Just having some fundamental baseline of all right, what is efficient for everybody. People can have differences in their body anatomy, their contours, their genuverum valgum, all differences in your structural anatomy. But the direction is one constant that we can keep. So again, that would, I just related that some of the variables we have. Like this nice perfect twisty, which, you know, they like making an argument that things used to be different, therefore we should move doesn't include the fact that they aren't that way now. Most people, this is their running surface. So yeah, what do, you, what, do you mean, what do you mean by that? How many places like this, meaning paved, or seen two-dimensional, hard, inorganic surfaces over long, straight periods of time for no reason other than moving in a consistent cadence with nothing in your hands. Yeah. No objective to get at, nothing for a visual or visual focus on, meaning running just to run on the road. Well, that's a modern is, thing. Well, my thing, thing is, if, yeah. yeah. So, but that doesn't necessitate me. Well, just because that's modern doesn't mean that we shouldn't create. It's more. like at least having that as a baseline, just like some serves or some hits in tennis, you want to at least know the basic first, even though the basic isn't always how it is in real life. Yeah, but well, this is more and more real life for most people. And so teaching them how to move in that context makes a lot of sense. I guess the, uh, in addition to, not in exception of, my thought would be, what's the loss of, well, I'm sorry, in addition to this, how do we include things that get a little more of the rotational lateral, let's say four foot capacity so the people, I don't want to say more injury proof, but more resilient in a sense. Not everyone just wants to be runners. Maybe right. if they want to be a runner. How can we get the tissue and everything to shrink greater parts? So. And that's where it's sport specific. That's why it's important to have a different coach for each sport because it is going to be different. If I'm playing baseball, teachers want to run the bases or baseball or go for a flat ball versus football, turf, cleats, not cleats, but at least having that foundation of what's, what's the demand of the sport, reverse engineering and going from there. But yes, if I am playing a sport, tennis, I need to be able to stop myself quickly and break and switch directions. Then I'm gonna incorporate all the other stuff you guys do. Plyometrics, all there's a million different ways to incorporate breaking, jumping, plyos, because there are a lot of sports that need that. I think this is probably where I, I take a little bit of uh, exception to the sport specific aspect. Because I think about, I don't particularly love like, I don't think of it as like you're a human all right, what, what set of tissue and movements do I need? I, it makes perfect sense. And I don't know if it's right or wrong. I doubt it is a right or wrong binary. But I think the base movement, I think of the human movement capacity, within that I have, so it's either like there's by daily movements and then I have a stem out to another bubble that's tennis movements, yep. running movements. I think of it as human, within that human, like the body has organs that are within it. It's like. What are the set of movements I need to have to be a human? And within that, I can group together these variables, but they're, my life trains me to be like. Yeah, cause to your point, your tissues don't know the difference of what sport you're playing. You know, like your tissues, if you're playing tennis, if you're playing soccer, like your tissues are your tissues. They accept the same force. They contract the same way. Yeah. I think I should have my hat and then potentially there's aspects, but like if I have a, like 
if my running training makes me worse at tennis or makes me worse at basketball, then to me, and this is my perspective, yeah. to me there's something, and it doesn't necessarily mean that there's not things that are highlighted, like music, like if I play music that has different cadences or a movie that had, like movies, a horror movie or comedy, they still have the same actors, people, there's still different things, but you emphasize different notes. But that doesn't mean just because the horror, the, the script doesn't matter, just because the comedy, the music doesn't matter. So that's kind of how I think about it is like, it's, I, I look and say the horizontal perspective, the low and efficient, the efficiency, horizontal eye, like, you know, basically all about it, efficiency and then developing the forward lean, the getting the muscles, and like act the muscles, efficiency and optimize positions. That's like, that's beautiful. Everything you're saying, I absolutely love that. And so I look and say, do, are there pieces that then, if I get, 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 get this to an extreme, does that prevent me from having other things? And again, this is just a hypothesis I'm working on. Um, so then that, sorry, to, I just realized that to wrap that up, to make it useful for you, it's those things matter perfectly. And then I think, okay, well, so then the extension and the heel striking, well, would that be a beneficial thing? Am I missing something by doing that as opposed to, it's like, okay, well then how do I, can I have heel strike without shoes? Like you can, it's somewhat uncomfortable. And say, so do I lose little tiny adjustments to my body over thousands, thousands of reps? I don't know. Those are things, that's how I think about it and perceive it. And again, though, if, you know, is it optimal to run a marathon in these or an ultra marathon? Probably not. You know, it's a whole different thing. A very specific cadence of that. Everything you're saying too, it's like the 5K, you can get away with a lot. 22. Yeah. So then that's when it looks at a sports specific. And so then I think there's different exceptions to be made. So I think there's layers on it. And I think like, just like our mind, like a computer, there's different operating systems, there's different programs. If we're doing our job right, I don't want him to think about anything while he's running. In order to get to that point where it's automated, it's subconscious, we have to build it and give him feedback, take it away so he doesn't become reliant on it. Just him getting that visual feedback to know his brain, oh, this wasn't right. Until he sees that, we're not gonna break that movement pattern. We're just gonna press play. So it's just like taking all the individual constructs of that movement, breaking them down, working on them in isolation, and then can we work on them then in order? I wanna learn on arm swing, then lean versus push so just kind of learning like what order what variables but yeah i think if it's sports like you might take your sport of is there a lateral component that totally changes the game versus side to side is it a component of wearing gear holding something so it's just all it is just having what is i'm trying to speak of the foundational just perfect scenario flat surface running forward because then i can teach how to go up or down a hill based off of that if they know how to run on a flat we know if i'm running uphill i just lean forward more and turn up the tush versus going downhill turn off the tush and allow the momentum to treat it as an active recovery. So yeah, I think all this stuff, if we think about movement like programming, standard operating procedures, that's what I'm trying to do is just have like an Ikea, do it yourself step by step to all movement, standing, leaning, and how can I get it automated to the point where you don't think, where you don't think about it. And there'll be some people who just want to pay someone to put their desk together. But some people are like, I want to try to learn on my own and do it. So for those small percentage of individuals that are very self-sufficient, don't need a lot of feedback, then I want that to at least be out there for them. But I want to have other people, other providers, other coaches, other physical therapists that at least have this in their tool case in addition to all the other factors, the injury, so they can then tailor it to yeah. the person in front of them. The IKEA is a perfect analogy because there is something like, I'm thinking like where there there's a line in terms of like, obviously there's slight different perspective and worldview we see in terms of these things. It's like, okay, the functionality to an extreme in some sense, like, okay, I'm reaching. It's like, I would say, I'm not as concerned about the Functionally, logistically, like the numbers make sense. If I can get my stride an inch further, then over the span of 10,000 feet, that's 100 steps shorter, relatively yeah. speaking, right? That makes sense from a logical perspective. Just like an Ikea's desk makes sense from a logical perspective. It's you, it's cost effective, you can put it together, you can teach them how to do it. I said, in that last bit of logical leap, I think the arc gets missed a little bit. The same way, like, I don't necessarily need to be a craftsman to make a desk myself, but there's something to be that's lost when I can just take hard before and stick a thing in it. It's not a story, it's something like that. Yeah. So in the same way, if I would think lateral, I'm obviously not moving lateral by tennis as a lateral with a rotation in a coil. So in the same way, if I think it's so logistical, it's just lateral and then forward, I think like everything you're saying makes so much perfect sense. There's like a line that I would say 10% of the effectiveness of this, I don't care about because that comes at a sacrifice for the greater whole in a sense. Now, that doesn't mean that someone that learns to run like that for a marathon wouldn't get faster numbers. I look at it and say, is that last 10% specifically and this is where I think we're talking the same thing, but there's a nuance trying to like pull this apart for people is like, the way I would perceive it is that the last 10% I would get like, okay, if I wore a specific, if I wore shoes a little more padding and then more cushion underneath, and that allowed me to stretch my stride two inches further, would I be able to run with less energy, more steps, or less steps, more less energy and faster time? 
Yes, because that's like the same way you go to that has it one inch wider. It's like, that's good. If to me that throws off some other aspect of my performance, then I'd say, okay, let me back off just a little bit and say, if I have to go from here to here, I'm okay with that because I perceive that to be like a larger thing working. That's just, I, I don't think that's a right or wrong in the context of everything you just said is perfectly correct. I, yeah, for me, just coming from it like, performance versus rehabilitation injury yeah. like as 10 years as a physical therapist my main hat is it's not that i don't care about performance i care about you being safe and not getting injured so yeah. like everything falls back to that foundation of i'm not really super concerned about performance i yeah. want efficiency which efficiency comes with usually more performance if they're more efficient but like seeing all the injuries and starting to combine and correlate achilles issues calf issues knee issues shin is this a loading issue then when we're talking about what do I focus on? Does it make sense for this person? You just start to see it start to like connect the dots more, make yeah. a little bit more sense. But from sense. an injury standpoint, that's what's been rewarding for me the last couple of years is I really don't, I just like helping people. I don't like running that much. Yeah. I just really love helping people. And I know yeah. movement is medicine and that's where people need that outlet. And there's nothing more humane than just moving your body forward. So that's what it's all about. But yes, are there all little details here and there? Absolutely. But from my standpoint, you can work those out. I just want you to be safe and not get injured. That's that's my number one. My non-negotiable is uh, safety. Makes sense. Okay.